All right, I'm going to start. I'm going to start. So um, this is like a, a bonus kind of accidental talk because unfortunately one of the guys who was meant to be speaking in this slot got ill, so he couldn't speak. So I got an email this morning when I had a hangover. And he said, hey, can you do another talk? I'm speaking tomorrow morning, right? And I got an email. Can you do another talk? And I was like, oh, yeah, why not? And I looked at all my talks. and I was like, shit, I've only really got a CSS talk left. So that means, uh, yeah, big risk, CSS talk at a uh, JavaScript conference. The other thing as well is, because this talk wasn't designed for this conference, it's only about 35 minutes long. So that means that we get to go to the after party early, I guess, uh, before everybody else. We get to the beers first. But let's do it, fast, CSS and performance. This talk is going to be a fairly fast-paced look at how CSS could make your website faster, how it could make it slower, how we can identify that, how we can design around that. So yeah, we're at sort of JS Fest. But who writes a lot of CSS? Well, not many. Who writes some CSS? Who writes CSS, right? Yeah, most of us. Who enjoys writing CSS? Not enough hands. Um, Maybe after this talk, we'll have learned a little bit more about it and a little more how to make it fast. Um, my name is Harry. I'm not going to do a really long introduction. Uh, basically, I'm a sort of consultant performance engineer. I've had a really sort of nice sort of few years helping big clients make their websites faster, more scalable, uh, helping those clients make more money out of performance. And that covers a lot of things, right? But this talk is purely just focusing on uh, the way CSS influences that. One of those clients, a company called Trainline, uh, they're based in London. And I worked with them last year to help make their applications faster. And they published a really interesting case study which said that if they could reduce latency by just 0.3 seconds, customers would spend an extra 8.1 million pounds every single year. Now, I won't be directly referencing the Trainline project in this talk, but I just want you to think about those numbers, right? Something as small as 300 milliseconds uh, equates to 8.1 million pounds in revenue. If anyone is familiar with any of my work, you'll probably know that I started off focusing heavily on CSS, uh, CSS architecture, design systems, sort of large-scale CSS. Uh, but about a year ago, I started focusing way more on performance, which has been really, really good fun. Um, it's kind of the majority of my work now is making websites faster. But because CSS is my first love, anything that combines these two subjects is my favorite. So I'm quite excited to give this talk. This is actually a really, really new talk as well. I only finished writing it uh, last Thursday, so it's not really been given before. Um, so all the slides are going to surprise me as much as you, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Uh, but why does it even matter? When we talk about performance, CSS is usually one of the last things you would consider. You wouldn't really think of CSS being a particularly big performance bottleneck. But HTTP Archive actually identified that CSS is the top three contributors to start render times. And that kind of makes sense. You can't render a web page until the CSS is present. But the top three biggest blockers to starting to render a page are all CSS related. When we look at why that is, we start to learn about the critical path, the render tree. This diagram is a very, very simplistic overview of what the, the, render, uh, the render tree looks like, what your critical path looks like. A server's going to give us an HTML and a CSS payload. There could be some JavaScript that could act on that HTML and that CSS. And the results of the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript give us the DOM and the lesser known CSS OM. And the browser has to kind of transpose those two things into the render tree. So any hiccups, any faults, any problems in this process is going to delay our time to get that render tree built. Any delays on the render tree mean that we can't start putting pixels on the glass. We can't start putting updates in front of our users. So we need to optimize this, right? This process here is what we need to optimize for kind of, well, real performance, perceived performance, and kind of uh, user experience. Let's start nice and easy then. File size is an obvious way to slow down that critical path. If you have to download an enormous file, it's going to take longer to sort of arrive on the client, right? You know, whether that's a, a nice, fast, sort of high-powered device or a low-powered device, big files are going to kind of slow that down. But that's obvious, right? Of course it's obvious. So I wanted to look at something slightly different. Uh, any idea how long it would take a Moto G4 to parse a one meg style sheet? I don't know why I asked that as a question, because if anyone did know the answer, I'd be really impressed. I'm going to tell you, it's uh, 200 milliseconds, right? This is a real project. Uh, this isn't common, but it's not rare either. This is an actual project. A client of mine had a one megabyte style sheet. Just to parse that amount of code took like a fifth of a second. 
We're not talking about style recalculation. We're not talking about painting to the screen. We're literally talking just reading that many lines of code. It took a Moto G4 over 200 milliseconds. Now, when I was writing this talk, I thought, well, what does 200 milliseconds mean? What does that feel like? So I decided to kind of try and humanize that figure. Uh, 200 milliseconds, light could have traveled 60,000 kilometers in the time it took a Moto G4 just to parse that style sheet. But then, like, what does 60,000 kilometers mean? That is three journeys across the Great Wall of China. Or it's one entire lap of the circumference, the equator of Saturn, right? Just to, in the time it took to just parse one style sheet. Now, I've got a bit of a confession. When I was researching this part of the, uh, of the talk, I learned way more about how fast light is than how slow CSS is, right? That's the impressive thing there. But still, uh, huge file sizes uh, lead to delays on the actual client, right? Parsing that amount of code is costly. Uh, 200 milliseconds is a huge, huge amount of time. Uh, another thing that would slow us down uh, is Base64, right? A good way to make a style sheet enormous is to stuff it full of image bytes that are all base 64 Many years ago, we were told to stop doing the, the top one in favor of the bottom one. We were told that, you know, well, we need to reduce HTTP requests. HTTP requests are finite. Well, in HTTP 1.1, that's certainly the case. So people started Base64 inlining their assets into style sheets. Uh, that started off traditionally being images, but it soon moved to fonts. So a lot of font service providers would actually Base64 encode their fonts into your, into your style sheets. Uh, this is what the JS Fest logo would look like, Base64 encoded into CSS. The problem here is that not only is this increasing file size, which takes longer to download, it increases parse time as well, but all of these are image bytes. These are non-critical bytes. You remember the diagram we saw that explained the render tree? Images weren't mentioned once at all on that diagram. All we're doing here now is making that render tree more difficult. We're making it slower by moving image bytes into critical CSS bytes. We're not really getting any faster at all. So yeah, Base64 is now widely regarded as an anti-pattern. There are a couple of really small scenarios in which you might want to use Base64, but they're very, very infrequent. Because yeah, it increases file size, longer to download, more time to parse. But that increase is on your critical path. Here's like the upsetting bit. Because putting images into your style sheets doesn't make images arrive sooner. It makes style sheets arrive slower. And that's all on this critical path. We're filling up these critical assets with non-critical bytes. I did an experiment last year where I actually took a bunch of data. I took um, a regular image and a Base64 encoded image uh, on desktop and on mobile, and I measured the image parse, uh, sorry, the CSS parse time, the image decode time, how long did it take the browser to actually decode the image data, and, uh, and first paint, how long did it take the browser to paint the first pixel to the screen. You're about to see some really, really useless graphs in a second. <laughs> the data is so skewed that you can't really present it very nicely. This is what we're looking at. On desktop, the green bit is what we're most interested in. First paint was much, much, much slower. Nearly three times slower for first paint on mobile. Uh, sorry, over, well, over twice as slow. Uh, sorry, on desktop, got that wrong. Um, but on a low-powered device, on a Moto G4, which is widely regarded as kind of the best device testing uh, sort of mobile for, for international performance tests, we're looking at this, right? Like I said, these are pretty bad graphs. You can't really glean much data from this. So I pulled out this data into some more kind of key findings. Uh, on desktop, it was over 10 times slower to parse a style sheet that was full of Base64 than it was to parse a style sheet that just had simple image references. Uh, on mobile, that was a 32 times slowdown. 32 times slower to parse a style sheet because it was full of Base64 encoded bytes. First paint, this is the bit that your users care about, seeing updates on the screen. On desktop, it was two and a quarter times slower, but on, on mobile, it was a staggering 10 times slower to put the first pixel on the glass. I think first paint on a regular, uh, normal sort of background image was 700 milliseconds, but on a mobile device, it took seven seconds to start painting to the screen, a 10 times difference. If anybody is interested in the data that went into this experiment, I wrote up a really, really lengthy case study, uh, which goes into a lot of detail about all this stuff, and all the numbers in kind of Google Sheets are all available for you to look at. But the key findings are basically that Base64 is nowadays uh, really, really, really regarded as an, a performance anti-pattern. We were told to use Base64 for good reasons, but now with H2, uh, it's kind of a moot point, and it just makes things slower. 
The next one, at import. Now, I'm not talking SAS import here. I'm talking a pure kind of vanilla CSS at import. Anybody used import before? Maybe for something like this, right? For Google Fonts, keep everything nice and tidy. I've done this plenty of times, but it turns out I shouldn't have been doing it because import is also really bad for performance. It creates long request chains, and it hides critical assets from the browser for too long. So a more kind of useful example, I guess, Let's say you've got your CSS project and you've broken it into smaller, more granular chunks because you could cache these more effectively if you cache them separately. You, know, you cache your core kind of reset for 10 years because it never changes and you cache most everything else uh, more frequently. So this is kind of a good for performance thing, except it isn't because uh, there's a saying in performance optimization, sort of the performance optimization world that is uh, a waterfall is worth a thousand words. And I guess a picture of a waterfall is worth a million words. Uh, this is what happens if you were to stick all of these style sheets away in at import directives. It takes way longer for the browser to discover things. Uh, we've got a kind of orphaned download here. And the browser's got that first CSS file, and it's thinking, great, I can start rendering because I've got the CSS. And as soon as it opens the CSS file, it finds reference to four more, and it's like, ah, oh, shit, it's got to go back across the network, fetch the rest of your styles. We're delaying start render here. This is a screenshot from an actual client of mine. I was working with them a couple of weeks ago. The vertical green line on this screenshot is start render. Uh, and what we can see quite clearly is that these style sheets are the last things that download before we start rendering. These are the bottleneck. This is stopping the user seeing useful content. The reason for that is we've got this very, very sort of indirect and kind of lazy request chain where we've got an orphaned kind of um, style.css request, which then spawns these four further ones. Uh, I guess the problem is the, the CSS is coming from inside the CSS. It's a very inefficient way to actually get this process underway. Now, I managed to reduce this client's start render time by about five times just by doing this, right? just flattening these out into several link rel equal style sheets. Uh, it got start render down from, I'm not even kidding, it was around two and a half seconds. We got it down to 0 0.5 seconds just by flattening out the, the imports because that long request chain was very, very expensive. Now their site looks a little bit more like this. Um, this is actually a reduced test case. So the actual client demo uh, was different to this one. But even in just my reduced test case that I built, uh, more bad graphs, that difference there, 412 milliseconds. 300 milliseconds is worth 8 mil to train line. So if you could go with this right, and say, give me 10 mil, these are huge numbers just for doing a very simple thing and avoiding the whole problem of at import. Uh, the next one, selector performance. Does anybody know much about CSS selector performance? Yeah, a couple of hands, a few little things. Um, my advice here is this is the last thing that you should optimize for, right? It is so fast already that you shouldn't really rush off to optimize this stuff. But it is interesting, right? It's something we could learn about. Um, browsers are really fast at matching selectors, but if we know a few little things about it, we can make the browser even faster. So browsers actually read selectors from uh, right to left. We read selectors from left to right. We'd start at the left and see, oh, well, there's this with this and this inside this. A browser works the complete opposite way around. A browser starts here, and that's called the key selector. Who knew that? Hey, that's good. That's quite a lot of hands. The browser starts at the right-hand side. It starts with the key selector. And the reason this is called the key selector is, well, there are a few reasons. The key selector is the most important one because this is the thing we're actually styling. Right? This is the thing that gets styled. This is the subject of the selector. Everything before the key selector is just conditionals. They're effectively if statements. If it's inside this, if it's next to this, if it's adjoined to this, then style this. The second reason it's called the key selector is because it does hold the key to performance. It's this selector that will, that will govern how fast your selector is. Um, there's a really elegant reason why browsers do this. There's a really elegant reason as to why the key selector is on the right and why it's faster. I live my life through really bad analogies, right? I try and explain things with like forced metaphors, but I do actually think this next one works. The reason why the browser starts on the right-hand side is the exact same reason that when you were a child playing these puzzle games, you would start on the right-hand side as well. You're a kid, right? You're eight years old. You're busy. You've got things to do. You've not got time for puzzle games. So you start at the right-hand side because you think, if I start here at the, at the piggy bank and work backwards, I'm guaranteed to solve this puzzle. If I start on the left-hand side, I've got a 33% chance. What the browser does is it looks at your selector, and it goes right to the end. And if it sees a class, for example, of active, it will look through the HTML. 
And if there isn't a class of active in the HTML, it can just stop work immediately. It doesn't need to do any other work. So the browser starts at the right-hand side because it wants to find that pot of gold. It wants to find that kind of piggy bank. And it immediately allows the browser to decide whether or not it needs to continue doing any more work. I think that's a really simple design decision that browser engineers made years and years and years ago. It's so elegant. I just want to find whoever did that and just buy them a drink. Right? I think it's just so elegant. But this is why you need to, if you are going to optimize CSS selectors, uh, start on the right-hand side. For example, uh, a simple class-based selector. Uh, this is really fast because when the browser parses the DOM, it tokenizes everything and it'll get like a hash table of all the IDs, all the classes. Really, really quick to look up on those things. Sidebar P is a little slower because what we're doing now is we're saying, find me every paragraph in the page, every single paragraph in the page, and ask all of them, do you live anywhere inside of the sidebar? So starting with the key selector, we can see that we probably capture quite a lot of elements and then have a lot of false positives where we have to say, oh, actually, 90% of them don't match. So this is relatively a little slower. This is much slower, right? Because if you've got a complex DOM with maybe 5,000 DOM nodes, this is going to ask every single DOM node, every single one, even your script tags, right? Your meta viewport tag in your head, all of those capture or are captured by this selector. Imagine asking all 5,000 of them, hey, do you live anywhere inside an icon? And they probably don't, right? Because icons are tiny. Most of your page doesn't live inside an icon. So comparably, a selector like this is much, much slower. However, the bottom one is actually really fast. Because if you just want to select everything, there isn't a much quicker way of doing it than just saying everything. Years ago, when people were um, moving over to the star box sizing border box, there were people panicking, right? Oh, no, we can't. It's slow. It's slow. It's actually really, really fast. If you want everything, and you've got a character which means everything, it doesn't really get much faster than that. So optimize, or if you're going to optimize your selectors, start by looking at the right-hand side. Bit of a quiz. Which one's faster? Hands up if you think the top selector is fastest. Hands up if you think the bottom selector would be fastest. Hands up if your hands work. Hands up if you're genuinely not sure. <laughs> Who just doesn't know? Good grief. OK, this is, you're a tough crowd. Top one's faster, right. Yeah, good man. Someone put their, put their name on the line. It's correct. This is faster. Um, the reason the top one's faster is, and again, another bad analogy for you, the top one is only having to go one pair up the DOM. Right? We start on the right-hand side, and it only has to go one level of the DOM higher. That would be like somebody saying to me, hey, Harry, is your, is your dad called John? And I can say, no, my dad's not called John, because I've got that information very readily available. The bottom one would be like saying, hey, Harry, were any of your ancestors ever called John? Now, I'm English, so there's a 99% chance one of them was called John. But still, the bottom one, even if the, with the bottom one, if the first parent isn't an ally, it will keep going. And it will keep going and keep going and keep going until it tops out at the HTML tags. With the top one, at least we can say, only check the first parent. And if that isn't a match, cancel out and move on. Now, don't rush to the office on Monday and rewrite all your CSS to look like this. But it is interesting to know that there is a difference in performance between these two simple selectors. It turns out, actually, the bottom one, um, just generally speaking, descendants are some of the slowest selectors there are. Uh, years ago in Opera, anybody heard of Opera? That's a bad joke. Uh, <laughs> In Opera, years and years ago, there was uh, a tool called Dragonfly. It was their, their answer to uh, Firebug, I guess. And they actually told you how long each specific CSS selector took. How cool is that, right? And they used to do this for each individual selector so you could optimize performance there. Now, unfortunately, uh, Opera switched over to Blink a few years ago, so Dragonfly doesn't exist, which means these tools are no longer in Opera. Uh, who would like to see this in Chrome, though? Yeah, bad news, you can't, right? Um, I wanted to show you this in Chrome, but it doesn't currently exist. However, and I'm going to pause and take a drink whilst you all take a photograph of this slide, go to this URL. This is a discussion group that I'm part of and that a few people are part of on a Google Chrome like product forum where we are saying to Chrome developers, hey, we would be interested in measuring selector performance. All you need to do is go here and just say plus one, right, or me as well. Uh, so if you want this stuff to arrive in Chrome, just quickly visit this URL and just leave a comment saying, yep, I would also like to see this. Hopefully, it will start getting implemented.
However, I'm not that, I'm not that nasty. I'm not going to leave you completely empty-handed. I'll show you how to roughly proxy this information in Chrome. It turns out in Chrome DevTools, or rather in any Blink browser, I guess, roughly 50% of the time used for a computer style of elements is used to match selectors. What this realistically means is that 50% of your recalc style task is spent just on selector matching. So what we can see here, hopefully, is um, you probably can't at the back. Apologies. Uh, this, is my, this is my website. The entire recalc style event for the entire home page, right? 100% of the CSS, 100% of the home page. The recalc style event took 14 milliseconds. If I divide that in two, I know that about seven milliseconds was spent selector matching for this page. So just to do an entire page worth of CSS was only seven milliseconds. This isn't stuff that is worth optimizing for, but it's pretty interesting, right? Um, alphabetic CSS. Does anybody write their CSS declarations in alphabetical order? Yeah, get out. All right, we're not going to get into that argument right now, uh, but it turns out you're actually getting some performance benefits from doing that. Now, if the previous example of selector performance was the last thing on your list of things to optimize, this isn't even on the list, but it's pretty interesting. It turns out that if you write your CSS in alphabetical order, you get better performance gains uh, if you're using gzip, because gzip really likes repetition. Gzip likes consistency. If you write your code in alphabetical order, well, your, your CSS in alphabetical order, it will gzip better, but not much better. Another bad graph for you here. Uh, if I get out my magnifying glass, I'll find that the delta here is 3.24%. Uh, right? After gzip, alphabetic CSS is 3.24% smaller. Now, actually, kind of interestingly, if you're Yandex, for example, serving up millions of page views a day, maybe 3.24% is actually not too bad. If you can drop a build tool into your process, CSS comb, for example, into your gulp process, maybe you could actually get sort of 3 to 5% performance savings over the wire just by alphabetizing your CSS. I'm going to give you a really quick, very, very high-level crash course on why this works. Um, so gzip, general kind of... Kind of, it's a wrap around the LZ77 and the Huffman encodings, which are just general kind of text encodings. If we had this file, AAA, BBB, CCC, and we wanted to store it in a slightly smaller way, we could rewrite it as 3A, 3B, 3C. We could reduce the amount of data we store by storing it like this. But we can still retrieve 100% of the information by expanding this kind of simple algebra, right? So this is generally how gzip works. It looks for repetition, compresses it as pointers, and stores it like that. If that file was actually CBC, AA, B, B, A, C, and we tried to compress it, it would be just CBC, 2A, 2B, A, C, right? Nowhere near, like not smaller at all. Cannot stress this enough. This is a really, really, really crude example of how gzip works. But it's that repetition and that consistency that allows us to get much better compression deltas. So yeah, gzip loves uh, repetition. It loves consistency. And weirdly enough, it will compress uh, your CSS better if you write it in alphabetical order. Who knew? Uh, apparently, Brotly will change things, because Brotly doesn't compress against the contents of the file itself. Brotly actually compresses against an external dictionary. So if you're running over Brotly, there is every chance that this will not affect you. If you make things alphabetical and try and Brotly encode them, you are less likely to see these performance wins. Uh, mix in versus extends. So fresh off the back of that little nugget, I'm going to stay on the, the gzip theme. I did some research a few years ago about whether mix-ins were better for performance than extend or, or the other way around. Because in my work as a CSS architect, I get asked all the time, should I use extends or should I use mix-ins? Now, my general advice is always avoid extends. Right? It's just not nice. It messes up your code too much. I, I do genuinely consider extend to be an anti-pattern. Um, but I wanted some numbers. I needed some facts to kind of help me prove that point. So I did an experiment. I took two projects, and I recompiled one with extends, one with mix-ins. And it got some interesting kind of insights. So here's a reduced test case. I did this one just literally for the talk. In SAS, extends came in at 20 lines of code. Building the exact same features with mixins came in at 24 lines of code. But we don't really care about how big our SAS is, right? Because that doesn't get sent anywhere. We don't really care about file size in SAS. But I compiled both of these out. And it turns out that extends reduced to just 18 lines of code, whereas the mixin went up to 30 lines of code, right? Quite a substantial difference. 
Now, the evidence here would suggest that mix-ins are going to be worse for performance because they create much larger file sizes. If you multiply this across an entire CSS project, you're going to be looking at hundreds and hundreds of extra lines of code just by using mix-ins. However, what we just learned about gzip and how much gzip loves repetition, if we look at our scope for repetition in these two files, we'll find that extend just shares a couple of strings twice, right? a couple of selectors twice, whereas a mix-in shares entire chunks of CSS over and over again. Now, this is what's called our compression delta. right? This is the amount we could compress. This is the opportunity for compression. And it turns out, after we've gzipped this, the compression delta is 23% uh, better with mix-ins. Higher is better in this, in this, in this graph. 23% better whilst having more code, right? How weird is that? But it's because of this, the way gzip works. It just crunches that repetition. He eats it for breakfast, right? Just loves this repetition. So it turns out mix-ins are way better for performance than extends, right? Uh, to the tune of around 25%. However, that was a very non-scientific demo. That was just literally a thing I built in CodePen and screenshotted for this talk. So my actual research that I did in sort of 2016 was a little more scientific. I took an existing project, and I completely just re well, actually, it didn't take very long. It was a find and replace. But I just swapped it quickly from extends to mixins, compiled it out. We got this information. So on disk, mixins are way larger, right? In green on the left, you can see 108 kilobytes for mixins on disk. Way, way, way like bigger to store on disk. However, as soon as I gzip both of these files, uh, the mix-in version went down to 12 kilobytes. The extends version only got down to 18 kilobytes. Now, anyone who's familiar with TCP slow start and critical CSS might know about the magic 14 kilobytes. Anyone know what I mean by the magic 14 kilobytes? Yeah, a couple of people. In TCP IP, the first like, packet transfer that a brand new TCP connection can make is limited to 10 TCP packets at a time. That means that if you're trying to transfer a file on a brand new TCP connection, no matter how big that file is, it gets broken up into little packets, and the first 10 get sent in the first round trip. 10 TCP packets just happen to equal 14.6 uh, kilobytes. What this means is that on a brand new TCP connection, any file under 14 kilobytes can be transferred in one round trip's worth of packets. Now, if you're on a high latency network, basically a mobile network, the, ram the ramifications there are huge. You can reduce one or several entire round trips of latency. And we've managed to just sneak this file into that 12, under that 14 kilobyte limit, hitting this 12 kilobytes. If you're interested in this, I didn't explain it very well. I've got like a 30 minute talk that I'm trying to make last 45 minutes. But if you're interested in learning more about that, just Google TCP slow start, and it explains exactly how this kind of uh, congestion management tool kind of works. So yeah, it turns out that um, mix-ins are way better for performance. It's pretty tasteless to kind of quote yourself on a slide, but I've done it anyway. Um, this is from the article I wrote. Basically, it just kind of proves this point. Um, around 27% better uh, for performance uh, in a realistic project just by switching to mix-ins. Now, immediately after the talk, I'm going to tweet the slides. Uh, I'll make sure the slides get shared, so don't worry about writing too much stuff down. Uh, next one. Asset domains. This was a really interesting one. This is a thing that uh, is probably the most controversial, maybe, in the talk. Uh, me and my colleagues discovered this a few years ago when we were working for Sky. Right? Sky is a big sort of broadcasting company in the UK. And I was working as part of the performance engineering team building skybet.com. Now, skybet.com was quite a new product, uh, very kind of very, very fast sprints just to kind of get it out of the door. So we were just hacking and hacking and hacking, right? And just you know, creating, creating more tech debt than features at this point. We were just working way too quickly. And we had a task which was like, we need to stop everything for a while and just tidy things up. One of those tasks was to move our CSS away from the host domain and move it onto an asset domain. Right? We created a brand new static domain to host our CSS, our JavaScript, our fonts. And the, the whole idea here was to make things faster. This was about six, seven years ago before H2 was really a thing. So we were running over HTTP 1.1, which of course limits us to six concurrent TCP connections to a given host. We started just sticking our assets, our static assets, on a separate domain to try and maximize the amount of parallelization we could get. And we all felt pretty good, right? We pushed this stuff live. We went for a beer, and we kind of congratulated each other on this tidying up this bit of technical debt. 
And the next morning, we had bad news. Because at Sky, what we did is every single night, we'd get an automatic web page test. It would web page test would run against the website, print itself out on a nice A3 bit of paper. And in the stand-up, we would say, oh, the site got faster yesterday. What happened? Or it got slower yesterday. What happened? And we were all expecting it to get faster, right? Because this was a performance enhancement. It got slower. <laughs> we were like, shit, what did we do? We had to work out what had gone wrong. And it turns out that on a cold connection, the browser having to visit the asset domain, the ST1, the static domain, had to do brand new DNS, TCP, and TLS negotiation. So what we'd done is we'd moved our critical assets onto a different domain, thinking we were making things faster. But realistically, what we'd done is we'd introduced an entire series of network negotiation to get to these critical assets. And it turns out that this extra several hundred milliseconds, whatever it ended up being, um, actually made things slower. We made the website slower. So it was a quick fix, a really easy fix, is we just dragged all of our critical assets back onto the host domain. Any assets that were required for first render, any blocking JavaScript, any CSS files, we simply moved those back onto the host domain and left things like uh, images and stuff like that on the static domain. We managed to reduce that network latency. And this was like the gold standard. This is when things got really, really fast. Now, the reason I mentioned this being controversial is Serving assets from the host domain means you can't really get make use of a CDN, right? Because your CDN is usually a different domain. So you may have to kind of measure this one and work out, is it faster to have DNS lookups on a CDN, or is it faster to have no DNS lookups but from a static kind of origin? There's only one other guy I've ever really seen talking about this. Uh, a guy called Stoyan Stefanov. He works as a performance engineer at Facebook. And he basically wrote, um, make CSS a small minify compress, load from the same host name even, brackets no DNS, and minify uh, and inline it if it's small enough. So not many people talk about this, but an optimization you could potentially make is serving your critical assets from the host domain. Um, maybe the last thing in the talk. Um, this isn't CSS in JS. Right? I'm, I'm wise enough not to start that argument with a room full of JavaScript developers. I'm talking about loading CSS and JS uh, from different files on the same page. So I'm not talking CSS in JS. Don't throw anything at me. Um, but here's a really interesting one that most developers I work with were never aware of this. Inline scripts block on CSS on construction. Basically, what that means is that inline script tags inside your HTML they will not execute if the browser is downloading CSS. CSS becomes parser blocking, right? And the reason for this is that that JavaScript might change how the page looks. So what the JavaScript does is it says, well, if the CSS is still being downloaded, I'm going to wait until I've built the CSS OM. When the CSS OM is built, I'll see how the JavaScript affects that, and then I'll continue to render the page. So what that means is your script tags will not start executing whilst uh, CSS is downloading. Now, the way this becomes problematic is if you've got something like this, an inline async snippet, right? We've used these async snippets all the time to quickly asynchronously create uh, script tags on the fly. The problem we've got here is that if we were to run this through a waterfall chart, we're going to see this quite clearly, undeniably, we can see that that JavaScript does not download until the CSS is finished, right? Very, very clear from a waterfall that's what's going on. And that's because whilst the browser is downloading that CSS file, it refuses to start parsing anything in those script tags. So going from this to this is going to make your website faster, because you can start to parallelize these things. An optimization as simple as just swapping those two things around can make your website markedly faster. Um, this is something I kind of worked on with a client recently. We had a project. It was like a week-long engagement. We created a little performance backlog, like a performance sprint. One of the tasks was simply, let's reorganize your head tags so that everything's in the correct order. And what they'd previously done is they'd put all their link rel equal style sheets way up at the top, because they were thinking, if CSS blocks rendering, we need to deal with that immediately, right? So they were doing it for the right reasons. They were trying to put their CSS way at the top of their head tags. But what they'd inadvertently done is delayed all the execution of any inline script tags. No script tags would start running until that CSS had arrived. Just by swapping it around, we managed to make their website a good couple of hundred milliseconds faster. So that's one to be aware of. Um, and another thing as well is the async snippet is a complete anti-pattern anyway. Those little async loaders, we shouldn't use those anymore for a couple of reasons. Um, 
First main reason is that anything in those script tags, if you're using an async loading snippet, will obscure the file path of that JavaScript from the actual browser's look-ahead pre-parser. So the browser will look ahead in the DOM, and it will see all these different script tags, and it will start downloading them. If your file, your JavaScript file, is inside an async loading snippet, the browser won't find it until it's finished executing that code. The only reason we use async snippets is because uh, browser support for async didn't used to be very good, but it's almost completely universal now. I just ignore Opera Mini these days. Opera Mini never goes green, so I just pretend it doesn't exist. Um, yeah, so basically, to wrap up, I guess, that was a quick tour of different things. Like I said, this talk is a lot shorter than you were expecting, because I wasn't expecting to give this talk. But to wrap up, basically, a few things we need to focus on. One, optimize your critical path. Make sure you don't have any delays in front of critical assets. Make sure you don't have any outrageous file sizes that are required for start render. Two, keep blocking CSS to a minimum. Try and avoid downloading your entire website CSS just to render the home page. Uh, the problem I showed you with the one megabyte style sheet was a very, very, very enormous WordPress site. And what WordPress was doing is getting all the million and one plugins, getting all of their CSS, bundling it into one file, that ended up weighing over a megabyte. Uh, third thing, avoid Base64. Except for a few very, 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 very tiny exceptions, we shouldn't use Base64 encoding anymore. It is an anti-pattern. Um, import is evil. Don't use import. Try and avoid it at all costs. It just creates these long request change, uh, chains, which just further delays rendering. Uh, extends is also evil uh, for lots of reasons. I've got opinions about extends, um, lots of opinions about extends, but the performance ones are measurable. So extends is less beneficial for performance than mixins are. Alphabetic CSS is better, but only for performance. Honestly, don't do alphabetic CSS. And finally, get your head straight. Go and look out for these things. Look out for you know, these script async loaders that are appearing after CSS. Literally just move your async loaders to the top of your head. Uh, so that all your scripts will start running at the right time and will parallelize with your CSS. Uh, last thing I want to do is just say thank you very much for listening. Uh, the slides are already online, so you can grab those pretty quickly. But yeah, cheers for your time. <laughs> so I guess we do questions. Anyone got any questions? Questions from anyone? Yeah, Harry, hi. Uh, thanks for the speech. So I have a question regarding fonts. Mm -hmm. uh, do we still need to include like to, to include like different types of fonts, and how do they block the page loading and other stuff? Uh, so yeah, web fonts are a really interesting one. Um, I'm I really admire how many companies are moving away from web fonts and going towards system fonts. That has recently been standardized in Blink. So there's now like a font family system hyphen UI, like an official way of doing that in Blink now. But if we're going to use things like our own web fonts or custom web fonts. Uh, some advice would be self-host them. Um, ideally, if you can self-host a web font, you're going to get many performance benefits. Um, if you were to host them with Google Fonts, for example, if there's an outage on Google Fonts, um, you get affected by that. Um, self-hosting them allows you to do things like preload them. So you can sort of preemptively say, hey, whilst you're downloading the CSS, go and get the fonts that you're, you're not even aware of yet. So preloading fonts, you can do that if you self-host them. The problem with self-hosting is that you don't get like the Google CDN infrastructure. Um, but yeah, self-hosting means you're not prone to these problems. If you are going to either self-host or use a third party, make sure you use an asynchronous loader. Fun fact, if you just do link well equals style sheet and then Google fonts.google.com open sans, if you just do it like that, like as a normal link well equals style sheet, if Google fonts has an outage, if their server goes down, your customers will look at a blank page for 80 seconds. Because CSS is a critical render blocking asset, Chrome will try to find that CSS file for 80 seconds, at which point it just, it just times out. So Chrome's timeout is 80 seconds. So that's something you've got to be aware of. Always use an async loader. Once you've got them on the um, device, if you're self-hosting, stick them in a very aggressive permanent service worker cache. Um, fonts never really change. I've worked on projects where the actual font file hasn't changed for like four years. So cache them separately, cache them aggressively in a service worker cache. And yeah, read up on which browsers do which things. Um, currently, uh, IE, in my opinion, handles web fonts the best. It'll give the flash of unstyled text first and then it'll do the proper web font when it arrives. 
Chrome waits for three seconds, so users see nothing for three seconds, and then they see a web font when it arrives. If it doesn't arrive, it will then use the fallback. Safari is the worst of the bunch, because Safari has an infinite timeout, where if your web fonts never arrive, users never see any text. That's why it's critical to use an async loader. That was, that was a long answer to a short question, sorry. I'm trying to fill time. Uh, hand at the back. We'll, we'll gradually send the microphone around. Thank you for the talk. Uh, tell please, wh what is the golden standard for the page rendering on the Moto G4 you are testing your um, <laughs> Yeah, sorry, what was the gold standard uh, for the, the for time? The, or? For the, yes, t uh, time to render the page on the um, Moto G4. So it's really, really, that's a, I mean, it's a great question, but it's almost impossible to answer because um, it depends what your page is doing and it depends what kind of network you're on. Um, the one good one to follow is Google's speed index. Um, so speed index from Google and web page test suggests you should be starting to render within about 1,200 milliseconds. Um, that's quite ambitious. Uh, if you're on like a really slow phone on a really slow network, 1,200 milliseconds is quite ambitious. Um, so I, I'd say use your judgment. Hacker News, a site as simple as that, you probably can easily hit 1,200 milliseconds on 2G, but you know, a fully client-rendered JavaScript application, 1,200 is going to be a bit too ambitious, but something around that. Cool, thanks. Hey, uh, what do you think is better from the performance side? Uh, custom font with uh, custom set of um, icons or SVG icons? Uh, SVG, yeah. yeah, SVG. So font icons have got quite a few problems, uh, or icon fonts rather. Um, Opera Mini strips them out. Uh, Opera Mini to make performance savings gets rid of web fonts anyway. So if your icons are even slightly important to the UI, there's every chance they could go missing. Um, fonts are pre-compressed. So WAF, for example, uh, no, you can, you can gzip a WAF, I guess, TTFs, et cetera, are pre-compressed. But if you can stick an SVG in the HTML, the compression delta you'll get there is way better than a font. Also, if you're using fonts for your icons, you've got a kind of a network delay of, you know, you've got to go and get the font as well. Whereas with an SVG, if you can just embed that straight into the HTML, it arrives with that critical payload. So it makes first render way quicker. And then also, icon fonts are pretty inaccessible, whereas SVGs can be made very accessible. So SVGs all the way. Questions over there? Uh, hi, thanks for the talk. Uh, I have a question regarding the extend versus mixins. Mm -hmm. So, as you showed us, uh, mixins uh, uh, gave us better performance on networking, but uh, that produces larger files, which uh, then take more time to parse. So, yeah. what's the trade off here? So, um, my experiment, I can't remember the numbers, but the parse times were very, very, very similar. So parsing, the, the difference in size didn't uh, dramatically affect parse times. Um, so it was better overall to have better network speeds than uh, runtime speeds. However, if you're in a massive project where the difference in file size on disk is like 100 kilobytes, then I, I would start to get more concerned. So I guess the general advice is that Mixins won't be noticeably ever noticeably slower on, at runtime unless you've got a gargantuan project that's just weird. Um, so, yeah, generally you're always going to be safe with mixins. Uh, <coughs> my question is uh, for example, I'm often using a, a Google Page Speed, mm -hmm. and uh, actually, uh, I had few websites and one of them I just updated like I even content I didn't update it last one year and uh, considering last year I had from 100% uh, it was like 90, uh, 94 mm -hmm. or it was cool but uh, approximately few months ago I checked it and it was less than 40% <laughs> and this is like gosh you know like it seems like this performance limits are changing by Google or <coughs> yeah and one another if you let me and uh, another case is this uh, page speed is going to offer you to download those CSS and JavaScript like minified way and also those images and uh, I do this 
and right after you need to wait approximately two minutes or something like that. I, I don't remember now exactly. And uh, right after I upload those uh, new CSS files or JavaScript and also images, and right after this uh, page speed uh, test, again, it's offered me like, again, minified files. Like, it's like, it is never ends, you know, like, and I'm thinking like, how it's working. <laughs> like, I minify what they offer, but it is endless. So yeah, I mean, that's a real frustration. What surprised me is that even in, in just like a few months, it, it went from 90 something to 40 something, right? That's annoying. No, yeah, actually it was from 94 percent from mm -hmm. 100. And uh, how it can be in one year, like without changing any content, any server, like any yeah. service, and under 40, like this is like, especially so on mobile, I was trying to perform better way, but this is weird. So the reason for that will be, well, first thing is I don't really trust Google's PageSpeed Insights anyway. Uh, it's a good tool for marketing departments to annoy you with, which is a pain in the ass. I was on a flight to Estonia a couple of weeks ago, and I got chatting to the guy next to me. He was asking me what my business was. I was like, oh, I'm a, I, I perform, I make websites faster. And he was like, oh, I'm getting a website built for my company. And I was like, well, make sure your developers make it fast. And he said, no, I have. I've been looking at PageSpeed Insights, and I need to get it faster than three seconds. And I was like, oh, shit, your poor development team. Because he's just going to be there with page, page speed insights, right? Just hammering them with like, oh, page speed said this. So the first bit of advice is always, like, page speed is good, but it's very much for marketing departments. As an engineer, we want to look at things a bit more forensically, things like web page test. Now, the reason it will have changed is because it's getting harder and harder and harder to have a fast website, which is kind of annoying. Google keep making it more and more challenging. Um, years ago, it would be simply a case of, minify your CSS, but nowadays they say things like uh, minify it, embed it in the page, uh, asynchronously load the rest of the CSS for the rest of the site with JavaScript. And like that's a huge effort, right? Going from just building a normal website to having these massive build processes to strip out critical CSS. It's really easy for a tool to say you should do that, but it's much harder to actually implement it. So that's another thing is they're raising the bar over and over again. They're making it harder and harder to get these, these kind of wins. Then the other one as well is, I've done that same thing. They optimize an image for me. I'm like, oh, cheers, Google. I'll save the image. Then I run it again. It's like, you need to optimize this image. It's like, you just said you'd done that for me. So yeah, um, my advice would be just try not give it too much attention. And the other thing as well is all those tools are a little bit dumb. Right? The tool is, it's a tool. It doesn't really understand the context. Uh, oftentimes I say to clients, look, the tool thinks this is happening, but we actually know this is way better for performance because we're doing this trick instead. So yeah, I, would, I wouldn't worry too much. And uh, there is one another case. Uh, for example, if I'm not wrong, approximately last year they uh, published some stuff like about fast uh, page speed, like it's uh, special for mobile. Mm -hmm. And uh, they call it like AMP or something like that. And uh, do you think that it is working really cool or it is again like to sell some service by Google? Right, okay, this, this talk is now going to last for three hours because we're talking about AMP. Anyone got opinions about AMP? Yeah. Who likes AMP? Who hates AMP? Who's a bit undecided? Like, my opinion with AMP is that it makes the web faster, which is a good thing, right? We all want a faster web. As consumers, as business owners, as developers, we want a faster web. But I don't want a faster web that's controlled by Google. We've got to write non-standard markup that they've kind of defined. They say it's open source. They say, oh, it's open source. We'll just stick it in a GitHub repository. It doesn't really make it open source. You still, it's still controlled by Google. Just because you can read the source code doesn't mean that its ethos is correct. So they're making attempts to kind of democratize it a bit more. But it turns out, did anybody see the article recently that said, AMP only feels fast if you visit an AMP website from a Google search results page? Did anybody see that? Couple people, right? It turns out that AMP websites aren't necessarily any faster than a regular website. The only way AMP will feel fast is if you click on an AMP link from a Google search results page. Because what they do is you Google something and it finds, hey, look, this result is AMP compatible. I'm going to start downloading that page in the background. So it's not AMP that's faster, it's that Google start preloading that page in the background so that when you click on that link, boom, it appears. Now, the problem with AMP is it's been sold to marketing departments, right? It's the same marketing department who made you put a million ads on your website, and now we need to make it AMP. And I just want to say to those marketing teams, like, if you'd have just listened to me about the tracking scripts and ads, 
you wouldn't be paying me again to put AMP on the site. Let me rip all the crap out. We're going to have a fast website that isn't controlled by Google. Sorry. Oh, okay, I'm very impassioned. But yeah, I'm conflicted about AMP. I think there are some problems it, it is solving, but I think it creates a lot more problems as well. That's one for a beer, an AMP rant. Any other questions? Hello. Hi, Gary. Thank you for the talk. Uh, so I'm not a developer. I'm from testing world. Mm -hmm. And I would like to ask you if there are any tool which can statically analyze your code and warn you if you have some of these uh, performance issues possibly. Um, yes and no. So um, static analysis is usually kind of difficult in performance world because obviously so much depends on the network. But um, I don't know if there is a tool that could look at your, just look at your head tags and tell you that you've got scripts the wrong way around. If that did exist, that would be great because that would be a really good chance for static analysis. Um, but in the meantime, until someone does invent that, um, tools like Lighthouse are really good. Uh, it, is, it is a Google tool again, so you need to be a bit cautious. Uh, but I believe you can um, tie Lighthouse into your uh, CI. So in your build process, you could fail things based on certain metrics. Uh, Sitespeed.io is a good one. Um, Sitespeed.io can be linked into your uh, CI process as well. Um, if you've got a slightly more involved, and this isn't static analysis, but get a private hosted uh, web page test instance and do things that way. But in terms of like pure static analysis, I'm not aware of much. Uh, I think there could be more tooling in that area. Um, oh, actually, no, a good one that did just get released a few days ago by the Filament Group. A guy called Zach Leatherman made a thing which will look at your HTML, and it will look at all your like source set and sizes attributes, and it will load the page at different screen sizes, and it will say, at this screen size, your source set told me to download this image, but it was 71% larger than you needed, and it'll tell you static analysis for your image sizes, which is pretty badass. I can't remember what it's called, but it's by Filament Group. That was a good bit of static analysis stuff that came out a couple of days ago. Any other questions? If the question is, will you shut up, I can, I can shut up. I guess that's it. Right, well, I'm around for the party as well if anyone wants to grab a beer or anything and talk about stuff. But yeah, thanks for listening.